Happy to be here. Yeah, <laughs> you can consider yourself to be a public company. 
especially regardless of what my goals are. I try to understand that uh, I think my goals really uh, twofold in that element is is one is scale, uh, and uh, we'd like to be a billion dollar company. That's you know again being a, a, a small there's there's a lot of costs associated with the regulatory environment of being public. Uh, so you don't want to be a small micro cap uh, forever. And I think the other thing is free cash flow. Uh, because at the end of the day, you want to uh, create a virtuous cycle where you're self-sustaining, where uh, some of you, just like any other business, Economics 101, some of you are more mature products, and we have products that have been operating in space that have heritage over 50 years, um, where you have a portfolio effect of uh, some of these products that are throwing off uh, really good profitability in cash, but then you're investing to build that virtuous cycle in the next level innovations. And I think once we hit that point, uh, that would be a really um, uh, key milestone uh, for the company because after that, it starts to scale exponentially and you know your uh, mature products are feeding uh, into your new products. A lot of people ask us that question you open with about the uh, 10 acquisitions. And one of the reasons those 10 acquisitions are so important to our strategy is to get that scale. And also to build that portfolio effect of having some level of products in the portfolio that are, um, you know, they're already there, right? They're operating in space. Uh, uh, you can sell them at really good gross margins in order to feed some of the more futuristic stuff uh, that we're clearly engaged in uh, that our last panel spoke about. It's a fantastic question. So, uh, uh, with the gentleman from the Space Force here who did a fantastic uh, talk. I'm great that I could come uh, after him because he highlighted a lot of things that I think are critical to our strategy. Space is a really fighting big game. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure the general public feels fully grasped yet uh, that uh, we are in serious competition with China and Russia for uh, secure operations in space to include ultimately uh, around the moon. So, uh, so uh, with the emergence of the Space Force, we really on the ground floor of a whole new industry and a whole new set of architecture around um, how uh, space not only supports the work we're fighting uh, on Earth, but also uh, has its own uh, level of, uh, uh, of warfare as a domain in space. And uh, so we're looking at the architectures. Um, one of the recent uh, evolutions was this idea of proliferated LEO. And you think about uh, when you look at analogous architectures terrestrially with the Army and the Navy and uh, the Air Force, how these developed. Um, the the uh, Air Force and subsequently the uh, Space Force identified this idea of these big monolithic satellites as being vulnerable to the ASAT uh, that the general mentioned. And so we had to evolve uh, because of the threat. So we moved into this idea of proliferated LEO. What well, the administration has, uh, uh, well, I think was a good thing, uh, informed the general public of Russia's either ambitions to have nukes uh, in. Uh, and you say to yourself, okay, well, that introduces a vulnerability to even this idea of having a proliferated uh, legal constellation. So where Red Water thinks the puck is going and where uh, we've been focusing our strategy on is what's the next thing? And it's really a hybrid architecture. And the two areas that I think are uh, still very early stage where we believe that we can be uh, one of the biggest leaders in is um, the Leo, the Red Earth Orbit. Uh, which is, I like to kind of say, somewhere between a drone and a Leo uh, constellation. But sometimes we'll kind of colloquially call it an orbital drone. Um, Yeah, so that's the, that's the new way is, is, is this idea of proliferated geo. Now, it's not at the same scale of proliferation as, as PLEO, uh, because geo is a much harder uh, uh, area to uh, operate in uh, due to radiation and other environmentals. But we believe that the 
this is going to be a hybrid architecture where you're going to have a space for small geo in national security architectures as well, and that's what Harris focused on through their contract with the Air Force uh, Research Lab, whose ultimate customer is Space Systems Command. So it's an exciting area. <laughs> we can dispose that information, but I appreciate it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the first thought is how are we going about solving that problem is uh, it's a combination of spacecraft design, uh, material science, and propulsion, right, and looking at the different propulsion options. Uh, fortunately for us, our approach was to come up with an initial design that we funded on our internal research and development dollars uh, to come up uh, with some early stage uh, concepts of the art of the possible. Uh, and uh, DARPA has come out with a, uh, a procurement because they're very interested in solving this problem as well, particularly the technical challenges, and they put an RFP out for what's called the Otter Program. We bid that program and, and won as the prime contractor. Uh, one of the key reasons that we feel uh, it's obviously an emerging market. This is where DARPA, DARPA operates. They're looking at what the next big thing is. Uh, and uh, because we're early stage with that, that premier partner in solving these technical challenges, uh, we believe that that'll spin off into ultimately being um, the leader or, or one of the leaders in this space. So, in that orbit, and for the long term, we get to work with on the the technical part of it too much. Uh, uh, you can go to DARPA's website and you can look at what they've published as their ultimate objectives are, but it's a unique approach to propulsion that uh, uh, would take advantage of that environment in order to be able to uh, sustain operations in Leo, which quite frankly um, is really critical to uh, not only our national security, but the evolution of satellites uh, in general, um, one of the questions uh, that Dirk answered earlier uh, that I think he did a great job is sustainability and this idea of having a congested environment in Leo. Well, uh, Leo is where it starts plunging uh, because of this idea that if like something were to say break up or, or God forbid be destroyed, uh, in Leo, the piece parts itself would immediately deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. So it's self-cleansing in that regard. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, advantages from uh, either uh, being able to get high resolution imagery from VLEO uh, for both national security and commercial uh, or civil climate change uh, missions, or to be able to get the same le re level of resolution you can get in LEO but less expensively, meaning you don't need uh, as expensive cameras. So there's a lot of really good benefit to VLEO, and anytime you see a great benefit, especially an economic one, you're going to see growth in that area. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we actually started in Europe, um, uh, about a third of our revenue comes from uh, from Europe, and uh, we're on the SkinSat program, uh, which is the ESA program where we're subcontracted to Talus. We're the spacecraft uh, prime, meaning we're actually building uh, the uh, the uh, spacecraft for that program. And so we started looking at the benefits of that program that informed us that this was going to be really important uh, from a national security perspective in the United States. Um, unfortunately, uh, it can be very difficult for uh, aerospace companies working in national security uh, to share technologies, especially uh, really advanced technologies uh, outside of, uh, of our borders. Uh, so 
we look at the kind of what we learned in terms of uh, operations in Leo uh, from a European perspective at the high level, but really needed a clean start in terms of our data set design. So we did four, but the technologies are two different, so we have two different baselines, one of which is uh, U.S. national security, intellectual property, if you will. Well, it's two areas that I talk about from a policy aspect, uh, perspective. One is classification, which I think is covered a lot in uh, a lot of the defense uh, forums. Uh, the second is is ITAR. Uh, ITAR is a it's an absolutely necessary uh, tool, uh, but we also have to understand that we always go uh, to fight to to, to do our uh, national security missions with our allies, and I think it's really important, especially um, this idea of ITAR keeping up with technologies that are kind of moving from this being advanced tech to just general computing or uh, something that is more, uh, uh, does not need to be so highly regulated. I think as an industry, as you see space and satellites becoming more prolific, we need to be kind of really technology you wanted to protect in the space slash satellite domain is now starting to become a little bit uh, more commercial, and I think that it's really important that our ITAR regulations try to keep pace with the evol evolution of that technology so that we can truly have a global supply chain and work with our allies in developing next generation defense tech. Thank you. Um, with that, Uh, it will always be part of our strategy. Uh, so, uh, you know, part of our long term uh, focus on scaling is uh, we've done 10 uh, so far in our history. Uh, we just did uh, one, so we're kind of excited about that right now. Uh, but I think it would be uh, not uh, surprising to anybody that a company that's done uh, 10 deals in three years uh, will continue to use that as a tool in our toolkit over time. Thank you, everyone.